Hi, my name is Ryan Carter, and today I'll be presenting on why my security camera screams like a banshee, just talking on signal analysis and reverse engineering of an audio encoding protocol. A little bit about myself, I'm a software developer, a security engineer. I love to code, love to automate, love to solve problems. Um, I like to employ the hacker mindset, like to break things into, in cool and unexpected ways to learn more about the system and hopefully drive, uh, drive an improvement that makes it better for everybody. I love food, love, uh, love cooking, love baking. Um, recipe hacking is a passion of mine and uh, when I can get a delicious result, you know, it uh, really makes my day. And then of course, the standard disclaimer applies here. All opinions are my own. Uh, don't reflect the positions or thoughts of uh, anybody else or any current or previous employer. So let's get to it. Got a few different uh, sections to cover. Um, we're going to touch on what it is that we're actually doing here. Uh, the signal analysis piece, application analysis, hacking the signal, and if all goes well, we'll uh, we'll get to a demo. So what are we doing here? And uh, why are we talking about wireless security cameras? So my original goal, you know, before I even had the idea to, uh, to submit a DEF CON talk, was to use an inexpensive wireless camera to monitor my, my garden. And uh, this is the inexpensive camera I selected. Um, you know, it's got an antenna suitable for outdoor use. Um, this one's kind of interesting in that it has a, has a microphone and a, and a speaker, so you could have a two-way communication if, uh, if you wanted it. Uh, the nice thing about this is that it was, uh, that it was cheap, so, and it uh, seemed like it would do the job. This sounds fairly easy and straightforward, so uh, what's the catch here? I discovered after purchasing the camera, unboxing it and, uh, and examining it, that it requires a, uh, a cloud application in order to uh, enable and, uh, and pair the camera. This, um, uh, there's, there's no way to self-set up the camera. There's no uh, ad hoc wireless network. Uh, it doesn't show up as a, as with a Bluetooth connection. There's a, when you plug in the USB cable, there's, a, there's no signals there whatsoever. Also, there's no documentation online about this, about this camera to any real technical depth. Uh, not that I was expecting much from a, from a $30 camera. And then, of course, um, what brings us here today is uh, the bespoke protocol that it uses to, that, well, that the vendor application uses to communicate and configure the, the wireless camera. So take a, take a listen to, to this. This is what really piqued my interest and uh, set me down the path of uh, trying to do a DEF CON, DEF CON presentation. So that's the sound that, the, uh, that this vendor application makes um, to interface with the camera and configure it to, uh, to connect to a wireless, wireless network. Uh, I have to say I was was not expecting that. <laughs> that's uh, that's not not usually how uh, how you configure things like uh, like security cameras. So my new goal after um, after finding out that it uses a sound wave signal to to configure the camera is to was to find out what was going on during the camera setup and uh, see if I can't uh, hack on it, replicate it, and uh, if possible, cast off the shackles of the uh, of the proprietary cloud enabled. Uh, you know, cat app that the vendor supplies. So let's let's investigate. First thing you want to investigate is is the hardware. And um, as I mentioned before, uh, you know it, it does have a USB cable. This connector though only supplies power. When I trace the leads, there's no uh, no activity on the on the data pins. Uh, other investigative angles, of course, you know, check for for Bluetooth, check for ad hoc Wi-Fi, um, and Unfortunately, after many hours of, of trying all sorts of different permutations of, uh, of things, pressing the reset button, holding the reset button, you know, scanning with wi wireless scanners, etc., nothing, nothing was advertising. So that leaves uh, that left me to investigate the uh, the software in a little bit more more detail. This is the vendor application that comes with the camera. It's called Jawa. <laughs> Um, and it's used to configure the cloud camera. However, you know, like I mentioned before, I'm not really, I wasn't really a fan of having to use this uh, this proprietary cloud locked application. 
Uh, Java requires an internet connection. It also requires a, a username and password to be configured with um, uh, with this this cloud setup. So that that made me maybe a little frustrated and uh, incentivized me to uh, to poke around some more. Now, in order to analyze the vendor application, I um, you know I needed a test device. I didn't want to run this on my my primary phone, just uh, being a, a security paranoid person that I am. I don't really have a trust for um, uh, for applications that come from from dubious sources like the manufacturer of a, of a thirty dollar uh, cloud enabled camera. And as I searched online for information either about the the camera or the application, uh, you know, probably not too surprising to hear that uh, there wasn't very many, if any, results that uh, that were that were found. I, I did uncover a few other camera models that seemed to use the sound audio wave signal approach to configure the camera for a Wi-Fi network. I, I don't have any of those though, and I just more list them here as a, as an interesting uh, interesting aside. There are some cheap cameras, though, which leverage, a, in my opinion, a far superior approach to uh, uh, pairing the camera to a wireless network, and that's having a, having the app show a QR code that you then scan with the, uh, uh, with the camera. I mean, the camera has, well, a camera, and scanning a QR code is a, is a fairly straightforward piece of, uh, you know, is a fairly straight, straightforward thing to do in 2021. So I, I doubt, or I should say, I wonder if there'll be many if any more cameras out there which which leverage this audio uh, audio coded approach so now that we've taken a quick pass at the, the hardware and the, and the software uh, let's let's think about this signal uh, a little bit more see what we can see what we can identify and, uh, and figure out and along the way let's think about what are some things that we can uh, we can think about or look for as we analyze this signal of course, the first thing is we'll want to capture and visualize the signal. Uh, we'll be looking for things like uh, repetition, the variation in, in replay, um, you know, and if possible, we'll try to fuzz and simulate the signal in a way that can um, I can hopefully track with uh, with a valid valid encoding. This is the uh, the raw view of the signal as captured in as captured by Audacity and visualized in the uh, spectrographic view just uh, just taking a quick look at this it's uh, it's pretty clear that there are there are distinct tones and um, it appears to be there appears to be steps this isn't a, a continuous waveform that uh, that gets transmitted there's individual tones which are given certain slices of time you know that are transmitted for a certain amount of time and then other tones are, are played after that uh, taking a look uh, it seems like a lot of the signals are centering, at least here, around 3,500 uh, hertz, uh, with a few outliers on on the low end of the range, frequency range, and the, and the high end as as well. So just uh, is something worth worth noting uh, as we go about analyzing the signal. Now, let's see. One thing that I thought as I was, um, you know, looking at the signal is. Is this similar to um, to a modem signal? It's been an awful long time since I've uh, heard a modem, and um, obviously, obviously modems encode their uh, you know transmit information using using an audio signal. So we did a, I did a quick comparison against uh, a recording of fifty six k dial up modem establishing a, a connection, and just by looking at um, at these waveforms. It's it's pretty apparent that it's it's not a 56k K modem. Uh, the the spectrographs are substantially different, and uh, this this protocol, this audio protocol that they're using to configure the camera is, uh, you know, it, it's bespoke in the sense that it's uh, not you can't find information about it easily, and it doesn't track with, you know, other common audio protocols that uh, you might think of like uh, modem or fax. So. Looking a little closer at this with it, with our eyes, we can uh, we you know I I marked out a few sections that that appeared interesting, just really highlighting the um, uh, the signals that appear that that are, that are extraneous or um, that don't really track with what the rest of the signal offers. And on the left of the of this slide here, I uh, I put together I guess what I'm calling a collapsed spectrograph view, where I basically took all of the tones 
and I slid them all over, all over to my left, and uh, just lined them up to see which which tones and frequencies were were represented. And you can see that um, you know it, it does center around a, a 3,500 hertz. There's a small gap above uh, above 4,000 4, hertz, and then there appear to be some things at the at the higher end, at the higher register range. Now, a, a picture is is nice, and it helps us understand maybe how the how the signal is is structured. Yeah, but a picture can only take us so far. We'd like to get more precise and better understand what is actually encoded in this signal, and um, how the uh, uh, and kind of what the protocol is for for actually encoding data into the signal. With a, with a manual approach, um, you know, we can keep using a tool such as Audacity or, or other audio editing tools that, that are out there. With Audacity, though, I you can use this um, functionality called labeling. You position the cursor over each one of those, um, you know, sections where, where there appears to be a distinct tone. You press Control B, and it will cause Audacity to uh, to label that time slice and mark the the frequency that's detected at that at that point in time. And so you can see just in the signal in this picture here, it might be a little smaller, a little hard to see, but I've got a bunch of labels on each one of these tones. Um, this next view here is uh, the audacity view where you can uh, view the labels that uh, that you've that you've taken. You can go to you know edit labels, edit labels, and you can uh, export them to a text file, which you know you could run through some other type of automated analysis or plug it into a spreadsheet or or, or what have you. Let's take a little closer look at this, and you can see that um, Audacity is mapping a low and a high frequency that it detects at, at that time slice. The, these frequencies are a little variable. So to me, it looks like uh, this, this puts us in, in the ballpark for what each of the um, target tones are. I don't imagine the, uh, the application, the vendor application is really putting out 5101.89 hertz. It's probably something a bit more, a bit more round. You know, but uh, we'll we'll figure figure out more about that as as we go along in this process. What uh, what do we know now from doing our quick manual analysis? Uh, we can see that there's uh, there is encoding going on. Uh, there's there's a digitized signal, but the signal isn't isn't binary. It's not like it's just two tones, one and zero. There's there, there's a range of frequencies represented here. So there, there's some type of digital encoding going on. Um, the, the frequencies seem to be centered in the in the three to five kilohertz range, and um, you know my suspicion is that uh, the signals that are outliers at the top and bottom are are control signals, and that they they warrant a closer look for investigating how a signal how the signal is put together. And we see that there's repetition. I noticed that um, it, in my analysis of the vendor application and the uh, and the pairing tones that it that it produces. The complete sequence uh, repeats itself multiple times, at least three times. So, and then finally, we can see that this is not a 56k modem or, or a fax, uh, a fax signal. The spectral analyses just uh, just do not match. So, at this point, uh, we have to ask ourselves: Is there really much further that we can go in manual mode? And the answer there is is yes, uh, but with with a set of caveats. There's variability whenever you play back the audio signal. I found that each time I played back even the same signal from the vendor application, that Audacity would uh, would would slightly vary. Uh, that the Audacity analysis would slightly vary in terms of which frequencies it uh, you know it shows when you do the labeling process. And of course, manually going through the process of playing a signal from a, from an application, recording it into a, a, an audio editor, and doing that over and over again. It's very time consuming since, um, again, the app repeats the same signal multiple times. So even after you get a complete signal captured, you have to wait for the app to finish its full cycle before you can kick off um, another test permutation. And, uh, you know, just to be clear, the only options we have to configure in this vendor application are, you know, the, the SSID and like and, and the passphrase for the wireless network. So there, there's not a whole lot of uh, things that you can you can vary for the input. Then um, one thing I noticed is that there's no readily apparent API um, to you know to leverage the uh, the frequency detection portion of, of Audacity. 
There's no CLI option. There's no uh, readily available API option. And while I could have dug deeper into the Audacity code base to um, you know, better understand how that's put together and, and hook into it, that really wasn't what uh, wasn't what I was trying to go for. That doesn't really that's more that would be more of an aside as opposed to helping me on my main journey to reverse engineer and better understand this uh, this audio signal. So you know, with manual mode, we can do black box signal reversing. We can try to brute force reproduce the tones. Um, we can attempt to match generated tones with with spectrographic views, and then of course just um, you know fuzzing generating permutations until we until we find a match. This is a, is a very tedious and a time-consuming process, though. So I was looking for a better way to uh, uh, leverage what I have and what I know in order to um, Im improve this process. So th really, the next, next step here is to do uh, an analysis of the Android application, since um, the Android application is what generates the audio signals. And uh, let's take a closer look at this vendor application. So, how do we go about um, analysis of a of an artifact of a of a software artifact? Uh, we could do things like um, executing it and logging the results in a in a sandbox or a test environment. We can uh, decompile the uh, the package. Um, we can look for strings, you know, that anything that might relate to audio or sound, or um, you know, SSIDs and passwords, things of that nature. We can do a key method search since um, this is a Android uses a higher level language, or at least I should say, this uh, uh, this APK is written to uh, you know to a higher level language, and even though vendors can obfuscate their code, it's it's a lot harder to obfuscate the the underlying library functions that that you use as a vendor. So you can do thing you could do a search for um, you know Android system calls or Android libraries that that provide methods that you might need when dealing with audio and audio encoding. Uh, you know, once we figure out these code paths, we can attempt to do high-speed fuzzing. And then, of course, if we, uh, if we identify something that has been obfuscated, we can, uh, we can try to go and de-obfuscate it and uh, attribute uh, the classes, the methods, the properties, some other identifiers which uh, makes more sense to humans and uh, helps us better reason about the code to, uh, you know, to really figure out how this all works. Now, let's talk a little bit about preparation. You'll need to you know, prepare your computer to uh, pull the APK off of your test device. Um, you know, if you've done any of this, if you've worked with Android before, you've, you've, you're probably already familiar with this. And you need to make sure your developer mode is enabled, that you've allowed USB debugging, make sure that you have Android Studio installed, and that a version of ADB is correctly um, placed in your path. So that way you can um, uh, leverage it for the, for the purposes of, of this. You'll want to extract the uh, the Android package, you know. And here I I show a few commands that you can use if you want to you know follow along afterwards uh, and, and try this. You'll want to make sure that you um, take the output of each step and feed it into the next step, since um, what I have here is really only applicable to um, a, a a BlackBerry Priv, because <laughs> this is the, uh, the the test device that I had lying around after all these years to uh, to do this analysis on. Once you have the APK, you can use a tool to decompile it. I leveraged uh, JADX. Um, you can go to the GitHub page, pull the latest release, and then it's a, it's very simple to, to decompile the code. Just um, a quick one-liner. You, you will probably note that um, it'll show finished with errors. I found that uh, the errors did not negatively impact my analysis of, of the package, and uh, I was not impeded in my, in my journey. Once you're in, once you have the decompiled sources, you'll want to open up a new Android Studio project. Um, you know, open the decompiled sources from from JADX, and then click a, a little button in the lower right hand corner that says uh, configure the Android framework. Um, by configuring the Android framework, um, it, it enables you to do things like um, find usages and um, go to definition, just um, all the goodness that you'd expect from a from a modern IDE. Once it's loaded, you'll see a bunch of classes um, on the side. You know, this the one that I have highlighted there is uh, u.ally, which is uh, clearly clearly obfuscated. As you drill into there, there's a, there's a bunch of obfuscated classes and, and methods. Now, a quick note on obfuscated code. 
Uh, what is obfuscation? Uh, sometimes software makers want to hide their, their implementations. Uh, they want to impede you from figuring out how it how they work and uh, you know from reverse engineering it to better understand what the um, you know what the underlying mechanisms of its of its operation are. Uh, with with higher level languages, you get uh, terse randomly generated identifiers. You know, you might have a class named lowercase a. You might have a method named, you know, F999, or just whatever the case case may be. It's harder to obfuscate uh, the use of system libraries in a, in a higher level language, since, um, you know, those uh, those decompile cleanly back to uh, back to base libraries. So uh, why do we use Android Studio? Or I should say, what are, what's the advantage of using Android Studio is in your manual deobfuscation process? Um, you know, it's it's a very slick IDE. It's it's free. It's readily available. You know, it receives a lot of a lot of support. A lot of people use it, and then of course you get all the all the classic IDE functionality like uh, find usages, go to declarations, um, things like that. With Android in particular, you get a logcat uh, instance or logcat window, which lets you search. Um, you can also target specific applications that are running on a phone to reduce the verbosity of uh, of the messages that. That you see and better help you tailor your analysis. Let's take a look at um, what we can do with this application. So live log analysis. Uh, you know this this is one of the first things I, I tried because uh, being a developer myself, I know that oftentimes the debug logs will contain a wealth of information. And um, as a regular user of the of the phone or the service or the application, a regular user is not going to see the debug output. So if you're uh, rushing a release out the door um, and you don't disable your debug output, you know, somebody like me is going to come along and uh, hook up the device, hook up the Android phone to uh, to Logcat and investigate for, for messages if we're curious about what's going on. Now, let's take a look at um, what logs we get as we as we start this application. Here's the login screen. Um, here's a little capture from uh, from Logcat. And we can see that there's there's some interesting information uh, in there. There appears to be some kind of an encoded payload. There's um, some interesting strings in there. And we, we appear to be getting both um, you know informational and, and debug output. So you know there's there's a URL, the ap.jawalife.net, you know, go Jawas. <laughs> And then uh, as we as we kind of uh, continue scrolling through the screen, there's a lot more messages um, like this. When you uh, try the camera pairing process, you have to enter in the SSID and the password. And um, at this stage, we see that um, there's log output, which logs the, the SSID, the password, and then what appears to be uh, some kind of a randomly generated token. And uh, in this log output, I know it's really hard to see here, but there's a there's a class that we can start to investigate, and then there's a, a what appears to be an HTTP helper class, which is um, what helps uh, send and receive messages back from the the cloud cloud server. Let's uh, try to pair to a camera and and see what we get. So there's a button that says uh, click to send the sound wave. <laughs> Just uh, love it. It makes me smile when I when I see that. And uh, when we send the sound wave, we uh, we get some additional information, and it may not look like much, but um, there are a few strings here which which can help help in the analysis. We found, um, you know, just to recap what we found so far, we found a distinctive characters, we found URLs, we found a class to investigate this a bind device new activity. That sounds particularly fitting, given that we are trying to. Uh, enable and configure a, a new a new camera device. So where does this lead us? Um, we can continue our search by taking those strings that we found in the log output and searching for them within Android Studio. And uh, as as I searched through the, uh, the the decompiled output, I found found a few things. It looks like um, the the number one is used to delimit fields. Um, they 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 call the uh, random generated code. They call it a smart code. Then uh, there's a, a character, sorry, a string one that's appended at the end of this uh, little message block. And um, you know, even though Android Studio is calling this message DB notify reached, 
I, I kind of wonder if this isn't a, a, a decompilation artifact of, of some kind, because it really is just uh, just the string of the character one. <laughs> so what is this smart code thing? Uh, I noticed that each time I tried to pair via the camera to the to the cloud app, this smart code would would change. It um, it would be different every time. And I could see by looking at this um, at this boot up code that yes, every time that that you attempt to pair the camera, you uh, get characters and numbers for six characters, and uh, that constitutes the, uh, the smart code. But the question still remains: like, what is this thing? And just after having gone through this this entire analysis process and seen it uh, seen it change with every single time that I attempt to pair, and noticing that. Whenever I paired the camera, a message was sent from the from the application up to the cloud server that included the random code. I can only presume that uh, the uh, backend cloud service uses this random code to tie this camera to my user account in the in the cloud. Since um, you know, it's it, that, how else is the the camera going to identify that it uh, you know belongs to my to my account? So that that's the best guess that I have for what this what this code is is used for. Um, as we continue looking through the the strings, we can see um, other strings which guide us to processes. Sorry, to to functions methods that uh, that warrant further investigation, like run and play voice. Both of those sound, you know, they sound good. Let's uh let's let's take a closer look and uh, do an extractive analysis. At this point, we've um, we've uncovered a lot of uh, you know a lot of a lot of functions, a lot of methods, um, uh, static you know uh, constants in in the code base, and uh, we want to take you know the, the key sections out of the vendor application, put them in a clean project, so that way we can uh, we can perform an analysis. Just a couple of notes on on setting up the um, uh, the, the clean application. If the you know if you're looking at another application which like this application here leverages native libraries, you'll need to manually create a JNI libs folder, put all those um, compiled libraries into the JNI libs directory, and then you'll need to have make the make the Java class that matches uh, the package structure has to be the same. So uh, this thing is called like com .i -think .voice in the vendor application. I can't call it um, com.test.reverseengineer. I have to name the package structure the same because um, the way that JNI works, it, um, it it requires those two things to to match up. And once you have your, your uh, sample test project set up, you're able to perform a black box analysis of the, uh, of, of, you know, of the code that's used to generate the signal. And along this way, uh, one of the questions that I, that I had was, well, what are the exact tones that are being generated by the application to um, uh, to, to pair and bind with with the camera? Well, there's a there's a class called VCode Table, and um, as I ran it in this uh, extracted project, it uh, produced a mapping of all of the uh, the tones, all the tones is along with the um, you know the the characters that they map to. So this is what the characters map to. Uh, we have uh, from 0 to 4875 hertz um, and it's there are 16 16 states so this is a, a hexadecimal you know style uh, style encoding here now looking at what else we found here there, there's a lot of findings we know that android uses audio track to we know that the application uses audio track to play a signal um, we've identified how it uh, creates the payload as far as you know the SSID, the the password, uh, the random code, and then the, the delimiters between those fields. We've identified control tones like uh, the frequency begin and frequency ends that are that are just static constants. There's also a, a space tone, which you know is used for when two tones play back to back the same tone. There's a little space tone that uh, that pops in, and uh, that'll be better visualized um, uh, in, in a later slide. There, there's methods which play the characters. There's the use of a CRC values to um, help the camera know if it's received a complete signal or not. So uh, there's a, been a wealth of information that we've we've uncovered through this this process. So what do we know now? We can reconstruct all of section one and section two of the signal. 
because uh, each signal consists of uh, of three sections. And um, you know, now that we can reconstruct section one and section two, uh, really that just leaves uh, leaves section three. And um, I've highlighted in this image the uh, part of the code which is uh, sorry the part of the signal which uh, is is elusive at this stage in the in the analysis. This this tone appears to be some type of error correction code. It doesn't exactly track with the, the CRC process that the rest of the code base uses, though, which uh, which left me wondering. And since this is generated by uh, by code that's in a, in a native library, it means that um, I need binary analysis to to dig deeper and try to figure out what's going on here. My tool of choice is is, is Jidra, Hydra. I, I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> it's a, it's a free tool. It's a, it's a very capable, and it, it does the job here. So to get set up with Jidra, you'll want to visit their their GitHub page, pull the latest release for your platform, and then uh, follow the follow the installation guide. Once you have Jidra installed, create a new project. Um, you know, fill out all the wizard boxes. It, it, I just I just took basically all all the defaults and give it a project name. Click the dragon icon, import the, the native library that you want to analyze. In my case, I just uh, went with the uh, x86-64 library since I'm a little bit more comfortable with x86 than I am with, uh, with ARM libraries uh, at, at the moment. When you click the yes button, it'll go through and it'll do an analysis of, of this compiled library, which you can then um, navigate in the UI. So reverse engineering with Jidra. We need to know what we're looking at here. So you want to go to your Android Studio project, make sure that um, you identify which functions, or which methods are, uh, which methods in the higher level language map to functions in the compiled library. Once you know that, you can look in the, in the symbol tree and you can see here that there's a number of uh, Java Java.com interops, so, so JNI interfaces here in this native library. The uh, the methods that we're looking for are the get and voice structures that are listed towards the, the bottom of the, the screen. And uh, here's a closer view on what you would see in, in Jidra as you do this analysis. So now we just need to pick one of the functions and, and dig in. I uh, focused on this um, intuitively named function called get voice struct goki2. So I, I love the spelling of voice, and I don't know what Goki2 means. This is the function, though, that generates the, uh, the section 2 and section 3 output for, for the audio signal. One thing that I noticed as I was doing this analysis is that on the Java side, you pass in eight parameters to this native function. Yet on the, on the compiled side, when we look at, this func at the function signature in Jidra, there are 10 parameters here. So, um, you know, it's it seems a little odd, but then uh, doing a little bit of reading, I found that J and I calling conventions add, uh, add two parameters. There is a, um, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about the note on J and I. There's, there's a J and I environment pointer, and then there's a, an object pointer. And uh, these two parameters are front loaded to the, to the function signature. So those first two are just um, the environment and, and the object. So I have a, this top picture is the, uh, the raw decompiled view, just um, with all the, the generated identifiers that don't really make a lot of sense. The, uh, the bottom picture shows it refactored in, in Jidra to, uh, that to indicate that the, that the first two parameters are, you know, are J and I related. Now let's continue the analysis. Okay, so inside of Jidra, there's a function decompiler window. And um, the nice thing about Jidra, it's it's like uh, it's like most other IDEs that I've worked with. You can uh, right click on an identifier, you can uh, rename it, you can highlight it. Uh, you know, you can do things that'll help you analyze the the flow of how a particular parameter is used and, and manipulated. So this function, you know, this uh, uh, get voice struct goki two, it calls a calls another function. That leverages the inputs that are that are passed into this this function. Uh, what I do when I do this type of analysis is for each screen that I'm that I'm on, I try to do try to rename and uh, refactor the parameters and the methods, the functions, to names that actually make some some degree of human sense. So that's what I'll be doing here. This is the the cleaned up view, 
And um, I know it's small, but uh, the picture shows that each of those parameters are named to reflect what value they represent from the, um, you know, from the Android sign. And then, you know, I go from there, I check the usages. Since this is decompiled, you know, there's there can be a lot of, uh, well, sometimes it doesn't exactly make, make the most sense. You Like I noticed that uh, input parameters are uh, copied to local variables, and then those local variables are then used elsewhere. So uh, in the analysis, just uh, keep in mind what you're looking at, track the flow through the local, uh, you know, through any type of intermediate steps that, uh, that it goes through to see where it winds up being manipulated. Now this is the uh, this is the raw view of that um, of, of that nested function. Fortunately for me, and almost conveniently so for this demo, this is a very small function. There's only it's only about 58, yeah, actually about 56 lines long. So it makes it pretty easy to uh, to analyze. Uh, you know, again, since the, the the identifiers are all terse and auto generated, I need to refactor those into something that I can use. So you start with what you know, find a good starting point. Even if you can't get all the names to something human readable, just uh, do what you know. And as you reason through the code, you'll find that um, it, uh, you know, the rest of the pieces can fall into place sometimes if you enter what you know. As I went through this and did all the renaming, I found that the critical, the critical section, the critical operation that I needed to apply in, um, in my, you know, uh, reverse engineering project to replicate uh, the signal three. It just came down to uh, uh, a shift. So this is the line. Um, it takes the uh, the CRC SSID and then it shifts it uh, to the right. So that that's a very simple operation for me to perform in my uh, uh, replicated Android project. It is not something that I was able to figure out just by reasoning through the Java or by passing in inputs to the library function and, and fuzzing the output. I think probably with enough time, I probably would have figured it out. But, you know, just I, I get a little impatient. And uh, when I can go explore a little deeper and uh, more fully understand how something works, I'll take that opportunity. So a shift, that's all I got to do to replicate section three. Now, let's think about um, hacking the signal. How can we recreate this and uh, manipulate it to, uh, to serve our purposes? So let's look again at what we know. This is the spectrographic waveform of, um, of a complete pairing cycle. The waveform is comprised of three sections of a uh, hexified data. Each section is prefixed and suffixed by control codes and section identifiers. Uh, we know that when two sequential tones are, uh, are used, there's a space tone that shows up in between it to help the camera better differentiate and identify you know, distinct uh, signals. The duration of each tone that I found is about 50 to 60 milliseconds. And uh, we know the structure of each waveform section. Let's look at section one. This is, uh, this one's a long one. It's got frequency begin. It's got um, uh, uh, delimited SSID passphrase and, uh, and random code digits. It has a CRCs of, um, of a bunch of data put together, and then it's got end tones. Section two is um, incredibly simple by comparison. All it's about is um, is the smart code and just making sure that um, there's a proper error correction on that uh, that randomly generated code. So that's that's very terse, very short, very easy to reason through. Section three, yeah, this one's a little bit longer as well. We have some uh, CRC codes in there. Uh, we have another kind of like a, a mutilated version of the, of the smart code. There's uh, the passphrase bytes, uh, another CRC, and then, uh, then this thing wraps up. So we can reproduce the signal now. We know um, every aspect of every part of the signal, and we are able to, to recreate it as a result. So that's where the, uh, the demo comes into play here. I created a, an application which uh, can be used to pair, these, uh, pair this wireless camera to a wireless network without having to use the, the cloud application. This enables the camera to be further analyzed using more traditional, um, you know, but network, uh, network style of investigation techniques. So with that, um, let's go ahead and let's uh, 
take a look at the demo. In this demo, we'll be pairing the wireless camera with um, a wireless network that's hosted on this laptop running host APD advertising a DEF CON 29 SSID. To do the pairing, we will leverage the, uh, the reverse engineered application that, uh, that I created as part of this um, kind of reverse engineering process. Uh, where I've configured the uh, SSID and passphrase. Now, to get this camera to pair, we need to wait for it to get into setup mode. Um, after I plug it in, we'll want to wait for the flashing light. And at that point, the camera should be um, susceptible to our suggestion that it pair to a specific network. So. I'll plug the camera into the power bank and start it up. On boot, the camera shows a solid green light to indicate that it has power. Um, after it goes through its setup sequence, uh, you know, whatever that entails, I can't, haven't been able to really probe that, it'll go into a flashing light mode where we can pass it along our message. So, let's give this a try. All right, with that tone, it should indicate that the camera has received our, um, our pairing message. And in the Wireshark capture, you will see that um, the camera is communicating with with the network, and um, uh, that it's that it's paired. So that is looking good. Let's take another look at the uh, pairing. This time from the screen recording that shows the Wireshark output of our packet capture. As the camera goes through its uh, initialization sequence, uh, receives our pairing code, it should show up requesting an address, which in this case I've uh, targeted to be a specific one in advance. You can see here that uh, it receives an IP address on the local demo network and it uh, proceeds to query back home and attempt to, uh, you know, attempt to call home and uh, do the cloud, cloud configuration bit. We're gonna try connecting to the camera's video now. One thing I do wanna note about this camera is that the, the video connection can be a little bit iffy it doesn't always work and uh, can require three, four, uh, you know, sometimes upwards of five different attempts to get the video signal to work. Here I'm showing uh, an attempt to connect to the camera using VLC and um, surprise, surprise, it, uh, it fires right up. So go figure. Let's go ahead and wrap this up now. There are a few limitations that are worth noting. Um, it's not easy to discover the device's administrative password. It is six hexadecimal characters, and the password changes each time the camera is reset. It doesn't seem to be tied to Mac or serial number, so just uh, kind of brute forcing your way through it might be one, one decent option. Uh, the easiest option is just to have it pair once to the cloud and uh, pull the um, password off of that. That is not um, uh, not the approach that I would prefer if at all possible, though. So it's not possible, or not really very easy, I should say, to decipher the camera-to-cloud communication. 
based off of some of the code that I've seen in the application and uh, what I've intercepted between the camera and the, the cloud servers. The, uh, the camera has a local RSA key pair that changes on, on reset or potentially between each request. The payloads are encrypted and uh, sent over to the server. So even though you can view the payloads by setting up a self-signed man-in-the-middle server, you can't really make sense of, uh, of what the payloads are, are saying. So it uh, could be worth some additional investigation. You also get what you pay for. Even if you know the password, it doesn't always connect. VLC will sometimes connect and sometimes it uh, will not. So just uh, keep that in mind if you want to economize and save a buck or two on a, on a cheap wireless camera. So thank you very much for attending my DEF CON talk. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to spend this time with you today. So thanks.